The mission of City Club is to inform, connect, and engage our community to strengthen the civic health of our region. We emphasize civil conversation and listening to others. We begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people, and it has been this way since time immemorial. As always, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who make our programs possible. I'd also like to thank KMRE radio board member Robert Clark, who's producing today's program, and BTV10, who will be broadcasting it to their viewers. I'd like to thank our sponsors for their support. They are Bruce and Claudia Dizend, Danny Neal, real estate broker for the Moyak Group, Firehouse Arts and Events Center, Colshan CPAs, Opportunity Council, Pacific Continental Realty, uh, Unity Care Northwest, Village Books, Western Washington University, Whatcom Community College, and the Whatcom Community Foundation. Now, next month, the we'll, program will be the first of three uh, election forums leading up to the November election. Uh, it'll be the candidates for the county positions, so the sheriff, the county executive, and the county council at large seat. Our September meeting will focus on the city candidate positions. And in early October, we're going to have a special Zoom meeting to discuss uh, the ballot measures. And finally, I'll introduce today's moderator, Dan Ross. He will be m introducing our speaker today and moderating the program. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, good to be back. As Forrest just said, we are uh, engaged in civil discourse, so who better than a professor of public civility to come talk to us about it? Uh, our speaker is uh, Professor Stephen Stair, Sear. Uh, who is uh, the, the, the Sam Reed Distinguished Professor in Civic Education and Public Civility at Washington State University. Uh, were that not enough, he earned his PhD in the Political Science at U University of California, Berkeley, and has uh, support from, uh, for research from the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences, Century Foundation, and I'm sure a whole bunch more. <laughs> he, he's, able, he's here uh, with the help of the Humanities Washington Group, which is a uh, speaker's bureau for the state of Washington. And as part, of, they have generously underwritten his appearance today. And as a part of uh, their program, they want us to fill out evaluations. And on the theory that you're not all gonna wanna do that, there are three or four on each table. Uh, please have somebody fill them out. <laughs> and then we'll uh, package them up and send them to Humanities Washington. You don't need to put your name on it unless you want to get on Humanities Washington's mail, mailing list. They're, they do not insist that that happen. <laughs> so without uh, further, Stephen, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh -oh. I want to begin by thanking uh, several uh, institutions and people. Uh, first of all, to the Bellingham City Club, uh, and especially to Dan and Jane and Forrest and everyone that uh, made it possible for me to be here today. Uh, I also want to thank Humanities Washington. Uh, this is my uh, second term in the Speakers Bureau. Um, I was telling Forrest the, or someone at the table, I'm, the most interesting place I've given ta a talk to the Speaker's Bureau is the Men's Correctional Center at Shelton, uh, which uh, was really an experience going into prison, but not to stay. Um, anyway, I, I want to thank Humanities Washington for making this possible, and also the Tom Foley Institute, which co-sponsors uh, some of the speakers, including myself. Um, I want to also note that I, I'm connected uh, through the distinguished professorship that was endowed by Sam Reed. Some of you probably remember Sam. He was the three-time Secretary of State, uh, the only Republican elected statewide in the last 20 years. Um, uh, the reason he kept getting elected was because he uh, championed civility, bipartisanship, and he continues to do so in his retirement. Uh, and I also had the good fortune at the beginning of my career to get to know Tom Foley. I was the first director of the Tom Foley Institute uh, when he uh, surprisingly lost his 1994 re-election campaign, uh, which was the, actually the first time the Democrats had lost the control of the House in 40 years. 
and allowed Newt Gingrich, who I'll talk about later, uh, to be elevated to, to the speaker. Um, my talk today is the fruit of me trying to understand what's happened to this country. Uh, I can remember a time, uh, and many of you can as well, uh, when politics didn't seem to be uh, so nasty uh, and toxic. And sure, there were disagreements about issues, but I think what we're seeing today is a whole different animal. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about why I think, or how I think we got there. Um, and a lot of these, the story I'm going to tell you is going to be familiar to a lot of you, at least in bits and pieces. But what I'm going to try to do is put the puzzle together in a way that sort of outlines a, uh, a trajectory. Uh, this has been building, really, for the last 40, 50 years, uh, at least. And the fact that, you know, just more recently we've seen some unprecedented things like an attack on the Capitol, uh, trying to overturn a presidential election. You know, those are, I think, symptoms of a larger set of issues uh, that I want to talk uh, a little bit about today. I like to put my sort of conclusions in the front window so nobody has to guess. Uh, at the end. Uh, I think what, what's going on is society uh, in, the, in America is very destabilized. It's undergoing some destabilizing changes and I think what we're seeing politically is a response uh, to those destabilizing changes. Uh, some people uh, on both left and right are not real happy uh, with the current situation. Uh, and then right in the middle there's an exhausted middle of people uh, who just want it all to stop. Uh, and so uh, when I get to the appropriate point, I'll talk about those uh, extremes and why they might be uh, so upset. Um, so anyway, uh, without further ado, let me, uh, let me start my, my little presentation here. I think it's really important to remember uh, that uh, the whole history of the United States is a history of, of tumult and anger uh, although maybe not to the same level as we're seeing now. Uh, but uh, there's very few periods in American history uh, when we've all sort of got along. And going back to the very early uh, founding of the United States, I mean, historians call that post-revolutionary period the age of passion. Uh, one called it a decades-long shouting match uh, between Jefferson and Hamilton. He had the the Federalists on one side and the Democratic Republicans on the other side. Um, and what's interesting is they were arguing about some of the same things we're arguing about today. Uh, things like immigration, things like uh, uh, immigration, tariffs, uh, trade, national defense, who was a real American and who wasn't. Uh, and of course, this period sort of culminated uh, with the duel between Alexander Hamilton and a sitting vice president. Aaron Burr was Jefferson's vice president. And uh, of course, Hamilton expired in that duel, if you've seen the musical. I, if you haven't seen the musical, I'm sorry, I have spoiler alert. Uh, he <laughs> dies at the end. Anyway, uh, of course, the run up to the Civil War, uh, we saw the caning of Representative Preston Brooks by a senator. We saw gunplay in the US Senate uh, and uh, brawls on the House of Representatives. Of course, the real. Civil War, and so even our earliest periods politically have not been uh, all peaches and cream. Um, social scientists like to uh, talk about why you should be listening to the rest of the presentation. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of evidence of why, and I, I think you probably realize that there are problems in the country, but I've got some bullet points here that kind of put some meat on those bones. Uh, first of all, the levels of partisan polarization are as high as they've been uh, since the Reconstruction period following uh, the Civil War. And this is true both among partisan leaders, uh, presidents and you know, leadership in that Congress, but also among mass publics, um, you know, the regular people. And so uh, we see a very polarized electorate out there. Um, we also see high levels of political incivility which I'm particularly interested in. Uh, the research I'm working on now, uh, there's a team of us that are working on civility in state legislatures. And it turns out 
There's a great uh, uh, deal of variability in states that have very civil legislatures and those that don't. Washington, by the way, has a pretty civil uh, legislature. Uh, they've been on the forefront uh, because of people like Hans Zeger and others who uh, have really championed civility in Washington. Uh, so we're trying to unravel that puzzle of why some states are so uncivil and why others are very civil. Um, we also, we see policy making in gridlock. Uh, basic national issues uh, can't get addressed uh, because the other side, depending on who's in the White House, the other side isn't going to let anything go through. I mean, recently we saw a big argument over uh, the debt ceiling and so forth. Well, the Republicans had no trouble when Donald Trump was president of passing a debt ceiling. And the same is true of Democrats, you know, when, uh, when George W. Bush uh, was, in, was, in, was in the White House. So anyway, uh, we're having a very difficult time of addressing basic national issues. Um, we, have, we have a hard time even agreeing on basic facts. Uh, some uh, commentators say we're living in a post-truth society. Uh, remember alternative facts uh, from Kellyanne Conway? Well, you just build your own reality if you don't like the reality that's presented to you uh, in the, quote, real world. Um, there's also widespread belief in conspiracy theories. Um, and you're, you're probably well aware of, of the you know, conspiracy theory du jour floating around out there. Um, I mentioned a serious attempt at overthrowing a, uh, a presidential election that culminated in an attack on the Capitol building uh, in, after the 2020 election. And then there's all sorts of other indicators. Uh, one that I picked out here, there's increasing numbers of what's called deaths of despair. Uh, deaths of despair are deaths from suicide, uh, drug overdoses, and alcohol abuse. And what's interesting is the cohort of people that most suffer from these deaths of despair are white males without a college education who are between the ages of 45 and 54. Uh, and so there's a segment of, of people out there who feel disconnected from society and don't see any way out. So they self-medicate or otherwise take things into their own hands. Uh, the last time I gave this talk was to a group of high school, and I, high school at a high school, and so I had uh, I replaced deaths of despair with the evidence that over the last 10 years, uh, the kids uh, are feeling more and more cynical and more and more uh, um, sad about what's going on in the world. So anyway, how did we get here? Uh, well, it's like I said, it's complicated, um, but there's all sorts of, of ways of coming at this. Some people blame only social media. I think social media is an amplification of what's going on, but I don't think it's the root cause because it started really before uh, Facebook and Instagram and all those other um, uh, kid-friendly um, uh, social media things. Um, I, th I think we're living through a period of, of intense sort of populist politics. And uh, I've talked to a number of historian uh, friends uh, who say that it's very similar to what went on in the so-called Gilded Age uh, between 1870 and 1920. Uh, we saw some of the same sorts of destabilizing factors that I think are affecting uh, our society today. Uh, and I've got a list of things here and see if you recognize these sorts of things happening today. Uh, income and wealth inequality uh, are really off the charts. You know, at one point, uh, the four richest people in the United States owned more wealth than the bottom 50% of the rest of Americans. Um, the top 1% control 25% of income. And so income inequality is, is really widened. Uh, again, since uh, the early 1980s, we're seeing racial and class divisions, uh, religious divisions, uh, rapid technology changes, um, the increases in violence and white nationalism, changing uh, composition of the electorate. Uh, you know, pretty soon, in the next 30 years, uh, whites are going to be a minority as part of the voting age population. Um, and the sorts of things that happened during the Gilded Age are the same things we're witnessing today. Uh, things like 
of partisan polarization, very close elections uh, where a few votes here or there can swing the election, divided government where control of the Congress and the presidency swings back and forth between each party. And we also saw widespread belief in conspiracy theories back then. You'll also remember that the social media of that time was called yellow journalism. There were thousands of newspapers out there floating around. So you could find you know, the information, the, the message that you wanted to read uh, through these independent papers. So again, there seems to be nothing new uh, under the sun. Uh, moving forward a little bit here, I think the contemporary story really begins uh, at the end of World War II. Um, some people look back on that as a period of bipartisanship and consensus, but then others say, well, really, was that really a consensus or was it the illusion of consensus? Um, there were some things bringing us together during that time period. The Cold War created a common enemy in communism. Uh, we had very strong economic growth when everybody came back from uh, fighting the war. Uh, we also had, of course, Southern conservatives who had these very safe congressional seats were bottling up all sorts of progressive legislation uh, in both the House and the Senate. And so they were able to block civil rights, health care legislation, all those sorts of things. Uh, so many Americans' voices were silenced. Uh, so if you think back to the 50s, you know, gender roles were very different. And, and uh, so uh, the way I like to kind of portray it, I'm a fan of Jim Gaffigan. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a comedian. Uh, a couple of years ago, he did a stand-up where he was uh, talking about all the troubles in, in, in the United States and America. And he conspiratorially leaned towards the microphone and said, but don't worry about me. I'm a straight white male. And so uh, he kind of encapsulates, you know, this, this illusion that I think was going on then. Um, some other commentators actually have talked about how civility is overrated because it tends to tamp down uh, the sorts of real differences. Uh, but I think what's happening in America is not disagreements over issues. In fact, there's a lot of evidence it's not about issues. It's about tribal affiliations. It's about culture. Uh, it's about ways of life, uh, which is a lot harder. You can come to consensus on, on issues. You can't come to consensus on matters of whether you think the other side is trying to wipe out your way of life. Uh, that's existential. And I think that's what's going on. I, got, I have some more to say about that. Uh, certainly, uh, by 1964, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, all hell broke loose, right? We have demonstrations against Vietnam in favor of civil rights. Uh, we have women and gay liberation movements and workers' liberation movements going on. Uh, so certainly, the 60s was an era of social change that I think provided sort of the seedbed for the destabilization we see today. Uh, many of you, uh, like me, remember the decade of the 70s. That wasn't a very uh, cheery time either. Uh, we had the Arab oil embargo, uh, which put us into the energy crisis and panic. Uh, we had the Watergate scandal. And interestingly, or not interestingly, but pointedly, Richard Nixon gets uh, pardoned, right? You know, more evidence that's going to pile up as we go forward that the rich and famous can get away with stuff. And so Nixon got away with, uh, with what he did in Watergate. We had defeat in Vietnam, which was uh, a very, uh, not very pretty. Stagflation, which economists never thought could happen, where you had stagnant growth and inflation at the same time. In fact, real wages, um, I'm not talking about salaries, but real wages, have never rebounded from the early 70s. In real dollars, if you correct for inflation, uh, wages are, have been flat uh, over the last 60 years. Um, we also had a change in economic policies, beginning with Jimmy Carter. Both Democrat and Republicans have, presidents have embraced what's called neoliberal economic policies. Instead of Keynesian, which is, the trick, which is pump priming, if the idea is you cut the taxes of the people, they'll buy more stuff, right? Uh, that's the pump priming, that's Keynesian. But then we move to this trickle down uh, theory that Reagan popularized, which really hasn't worked. Uh, but what you do there is you cut taxes on the businesses. 
and hope that they'll hire more people. Uh, well, what they do instead, of course, is they uh, raise their dividends or give uh, you know, higher salaries to the people who run the companies. So anyway, um, and then of course we begin questioning the large federal role that began during the Great Society programs that Lyndon Johnson introduced. You know, we went from government as an umpire to a government as national nanny in some people's eyes. And so we began questioning you know, that arrangement uh, by the late 70s. Uh, and so there's a lot of things going on in the 70s that, again, sort of provide sort of a seed bed for what happens later. Um, this is just to show you how trust in government, in the federal government, has gone down. It's hard to believe that in the early 60s, over, 70, seven, over 75 percent of people said they trust the federal government to do what's right most or all of the time. And now it's about 20 percent. Uh, and so uh, there's been a precipitous decline in trust in government as a solver of problems. And as I'm going to show you later, this has affected a lot other institutions uh, over the last couple of decades as well. And when you don't trust any institutions, banks, medical uh, professionals, then you're going to start believing in conspiracy theories instead because you've got to find some way to make sense of things. Um, so I think that's a big part of the, the issue. Uh, moving forward again, we've got the, uh, the fracturing of news. Uh, CNN started in 1980, Fox News in 96. Uh, we see the end of the fairness doctrine. Uh, the fairness doctrine used to require that publicly uh, traded television and radio stations had to have equal time on both sides. Now they wiped that out, and that led to the rise of talk radio, uh, particularly on the right, uh, which, uh, you know, again, uh, helps fracture uh, um, the American political scene. Uh, social media platforms beginning in the 2000s, um, and of course this just sort of amplifies and drives even further the sort of fragmentation. Um, I mentioned Newt Gingrich earlier. He gets elected uh, speaker in 1995 after the Republicans take over the House, after Mr. Foley lost, and a number of other Democrats lost as well. Um, but he made political incivility a strategy. Um, and I can see a little bit of his point. You know, the Democrats during that period from the 1950s uh, until 1994 didn't always play nice. They kind of, you know, pushed their agenda right on to the Republicans and didn't listen to them at all. And so uh, he was a backbencher, Newt Gingrich was, for six years before he became speaker. And during that time, he was getting madder and madder. And, he's, and he says there, you know, we're done playing nice. We're going to be nasty. And, and I think this is a big point because by making it a strategy, uh, it sort of legitimizes being nasty in politics. And as I'm going to say later, I think one of the maybe one of the solutions is we have to start punishing politicians at the ballot box uh, who fuel the culture wars. Uh, but so far that hasn't happened, partly because of gerrymandering and some other things. But anyway, I think Newt Gingrich, uh, who's still around, you can see him on Fox News once in a while, um, but I think he helped popularize uh, incivility as a, as a strategy, and a lot of people have adopted it. Of course, we have another watershed uh, event, uh, the attacks of 9-11, uh, which uh, began feeding the, the, the uh, fear mongers uh, who took it politically and ran with it. Um, in fact, this is a great book called Reign of Terror, which points out that uh, the war on terror was lar largely driven by uh, or, or portrayed as non-white marauders, uh, people from other countries, uh, from hostile civilizations. And of course, you'll also remember that a certain segment of society uh, glommed onto this idea that Barack Obama was a secret Muslim, and it sort of united the war on terror and the culture war in a lot of people's, uh, in some people's minds, not a lot of people. Uh, we then have another crisis, of course. We have the crash, uh, or the uh, recession, the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. And what was the government's response? Was it to help out the homeowners and, and uh, help the little guy? Nope, it was bail out the banks. Uh, too big to fail, they said. Uh, and so millions of people lose their homes. Uh, and Wall Street uh, wins. 
Uh, well, politically, this is important because this also heralded in the Tea Party movement, which started uh, right after the recession ended. Uh, this is one of my favorite posters right here. Keep government out of my Medicaid. I'm not sure where they think Medicaid comes from, but there you go. But the Tea Party uh, it's still kind of with us in different forms. Uh, and then on the left, we have the Occupy Wall Street, uh, which was more short-lived, but still had an impact, again, on activists on that end of the spectrum. And then you kind of join that together with the Black Lives Matter protests, which begin in 2013. And so you're sort of seeing a congealing on both the left and the right of, you know, I'm fed up and, and tired of the status quo, and I want somebody to do something about it. Uh, and for a certain segment of society, that person was Donald Trump. Um, you'll remember he was elected uh, it, with a change in 70,000 votes in Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Ohio, or Pennsylvania, I'm sorry. He, Hillary Clinton would have won the vote. But because of black turnout going way down in uh, Wayne County, which is Detroit, 500,000 fewer people came out and voted in 2016 than they did in 2012. And that would have thrown Michigan into Hillary's uh, category. Milwaukee, heavily black district, uh, 300,000 fewer voters in Milwaukee County came out. And so Donald Trump gets elected with a, you know, because of the Electoral College and just by the, the, the hair of his chinny chin chin, I guess he used to say. But again, I don't think he was the cause. He was, he was a master, and I rarely use those words in connection with Donald Trump, but he was a master at capturing that anger that built up among a certain segment of society. And he rode that anger to the White House. Um, and of course, they, we then start talking about, are we gonna head to another civil war? Uh, well, there's some new interesting research about this. The, the next civil war isn't gonna look like the other one. It's gonna be more like what we see you know, bombings and sort of random acts of violence. Um, but unless, unless insurgent forces get a hold of the, of the armed services, then it's not gonna be like the other civil war. Uh, we then start seeing violent protests uh, about Black Lives Matter. We see assault on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. And so all of these things I think have, have sort of come together in uh, a way that makes, um, makes our society um, uh, a dangerous and, and scary kind of place. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're going through a, a, a period of time uh, where we're battling over competing belief systems. Um, and there's some interesting uh, work out there uh, about uh, how we got so tribal. Uh, I think one of the things, and this was one of the questions that Dan forwarded me, uh, we know from political psychology uh, that when times are very destabilizing, uh, like they are now and like they were in the Gilded Age, uh, you see identity-based conflict increasing. And it's not so much that you begin feeling closer ties with your in-group, but you begin hating the other, the out-group. Uh, and so one of the things we're seeing with polarization, it's not just, well, I disagree because he's a Republican or she's a, a Democrat, uh, but they, the two sides genuinely hate each other. And I'm gonna show you some evidence of that in just a minute. Uh, I already mentioned that partisan leaders and the media have found it uh, very uh, strategic to use incivility. Media companies make a lot more money when people are shouting at each other. Uh, CNN had record profits during the Trump administration because people wanted to see what's he gonna do next? What's he gonna say next? Um, and so when things are quiet, media companies don't do so well. And so they have a stake. I mean, you know, remember the original, one of the original CNN programs was Crossfire, uh, where they hire people to yell at each other. Uh, plus, um, if you know anything about journalism, you know journalism is expensive. Opinions are cheap. And so hiring people to spew opinions, you pay them scale and send them on their way. But journalism is expensive. Uh, and that's why there's so little of it going on uh, these days. So between the media and partisan leaders embracing uh, a strategy of incivility, 
Um, that's a real problem, I think. And then finally, I think the social media again amplifies this. It makes it easier to, to get messages of hate out there. Um, you know, one of the, uh, some of the things I've read about how to uh, combat that is uh, on social media is make people, uh, if they want to share something, not just hit a share button, but make them paint and paste the whole message after the third share uh, to kind of slow down the virus as it goes out. You know, I don't know whether that'll ever happen or not. I, it's not my area of, of research either. So uh, anyway, um, I mentioned the real antipathy. The Pew Research Center has been tracking uh, partisan attitudes uh, on a question uh, for uh, the last generation or so. Uh, on the left there, uh, this, that's the percentage of Republicans uh, who say that they have a very unfavorable or f unfavorable view of Democrats. And you can see it's gone way up for very unfavorable from 21% to 62%. And even 99 or 97% have an unfavorable view of the other side. Similarly, the Democrats have an unfavorable view of, uh, of, of Republicans, not quite as, uh, as, as high of scores, but there, there's a lot of what we call affective polarization. It's polarization about the other side, not because we disagree with their policies, but we, di we just don't like them because of who they call themselves. Um, and again, this is not a new idea. Henry Adams in his uh, biography said, or autobiography said, politics has always been the systematic organization of, of hatreds. Uh, if you can only see us now. Um, interesting article came out a few uh, years ago by George Packer. I believe he's turned it into a book. But it's called How America Fractured into Four Parts. And I think it's a very insightful approach uh, to this uh, idea of, of tribalism. He divides up America into what he calls four different Americas. And he names them. These are his names, not mine. Uh, one group he talks about is the so-called free America. These are the people who we traditionally think of as the old country club Republican, right? People who are for small government, uh, limited government, for um, freedom from regulation, fiscal restraint, um, freedom from government intervention, so forth. They have sort of a center-right orientation. I mean, think Mitt Romney. Uh, he's sort of the poster child for that free America group. Um, he also talks about what he calls smart America. Uh, these are urban professionals, knowledge workers. Um, these are people who don't care about globalization. They don't care about, you know, you know government tinkering in the markets north because they're, they're, they're making out, but they're globalists. Uh, these are folks that are more of a center left sort of orientation. Um, and one of the cleavages we're seeing in America right now is People with a college education, a BA or better, and those with only a high school education. Uh, there's a big split in, by education in this country along with all the other things. But they have sort of a center left orientation, probably <coughs> a Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton type of person, right? Well, the real fireworks are happening at the more extreme ends of the spectrum. Uh, another group he identifies as real America. Uh, these are people, rural, predominantly white, Lower education levels, high school probably uh, only, evangelical Christians, anti-elite, anti-immigration, pro-nationalist, America first, right? Uh, and they are operating under narratives of grievance and resentment. They believe that others, and I think you know who I'm talking about, have cut the line. Uh, immigrants, poor people, uh, you know, in some cases women, they're, they're cutting the line, and we want to go back to the way, you know, we think things when, they, when things were good. Uh, you know, I talked about that illusion and consensus part. Well, if you look at, you know, who's a MAGA voter, that's pretty much who it is. Overwhelmingly evangelical Christian, overwhelming. Donald Trump won 60% of the uh, high school only uh, education vote. Uh, and so, uh, they're angry uh, about you know, believing that their, that their way of life is being wiped out by wokeness, uh, whatever that is now. Um, and then on the other extreme, we have some other people who are active over a different type of narrative. 
uh, these people are urban, tend to be parts of minority groups or their supporters. Uh, they are trafficking in identity politics, uh, more or less, and they want justice. Uh, they believe they've been oppressed uh, by society uh, for too long, and so their narrative is one of oppression. And I, it's really hard to, to put a number on what percentage of Americans fall into each of these categories. I've tried many different ways, back of the envelope kind of stuff. And as well as I can figure, the max out on this side is maybe about 20% of the American people. Well over there, maybe 15 to 20%. And then you got the 60% in the middle. And I talked about the exhausted middle. Those are the people in the, the uh, free American, smart America categories um, that I think are are aghast at what's going on. They're not quite as, as upset. Maybe they're more upset with the, these, these other narratives. And, and, uh, but I think the, the train of incivility is really driven by the, the real Americas and the, uh, and the just America people. Um, there have been a number of books, um, and this is not an exhaustive list of uh, books you've probably read or seen uh, mentioned. Some of them are a little bit older now. But both left and right um, are represented here uh, trying to make sense of why people, say in Wisconsin, are, are so mad or why in Louisiana, as Arlie Hochschild uh, did in her book. There are also some things going on that amplify this tribal separation. Uh, and some of them, again, not an exhaustive list. Uh, we're going through uh, what uh, one commentator calls the big sort. Uh, it turns out um, people are moving into communities where they face a like-minded community. And so people who are more progressive are moving to more urban areas, and people who are more conservative uh, want to get back to a certain way of life or becoming more rural or semi-rural. Um, and so there, there's a real split, and I'm going to show you a, a, slide, a map in a minute that gives you an idea of that of that urban-rural divide. Uh, income inequality and wage stagnation, I talked about that already. Uh, the lack of trust in government and uh, other societal institutions, which I've also mentioned. Uh, and then these cultural cleavages based on education, um, I think is another big part of the story. Uh, we talk about uh, landslide counties in presidential elections. So going back to the big sort, the red uh, counties that are uh, shaded there in 1992, those are counties that George H.W. Bush won by more than 20 percentages points. And that's a big win in an election. And the blue ones are where Bill Clinton won by 20 uh, percent or more. And you can see there's very few landslide counties. Uh, but then you can see as we progress through the years, uh, more and more of the counties become landslide counties, uh, meaning that you know, the votes are, of one party are concentrated. Um, and so, you know, the reason that Democratic presidential candidates don't come to Seattle except to get money is because they don't need to. Uh, they're going to win 75% of the vote no matter what. And so uh, we really, have presidential elections now have boiled down to maybe 10 states uh, because, again, very few people are truly independent. But they're also very important. Let me show you 2020. Here's the 2020 election. All the red. There's 3,066 counties in the United States. Joe Biden won, four, uh, won 240 of them. Uh, they happen to be the richest counties, but he won the, the national election by winning a very small percentage of the counties in the United States. And all those red ones are ones where Trump won uh, by more than 20 percentage points. Um, and then you can see the blues where uh, Biden won by more than 20%. And so, you know, Again, this is more evidence that we've, we've sorted ourselves into these sort of like-minded uh, communities. And of course, counties aren't all one you know, party or another in most cases, but um, when you win by 20 percentage points in a presidential election, that's a pretty big, a pretty big sort. Um, I mentioned de decreasing trust in lots of institutions. Well, here's evidence of that. Uh, organized religion, Supreme Court, uh, public schools, big business, banks. All these major institutions um, are not trusted. And so again, this just fuels people's uh, look. They're looking for something to hang on to. 
uh, whether that's a conspiracy theory or whether it's medicating yourself until, until you die or whatever. Um, and I also mentioned uh, the divide in education. And you can see that over time, uh, the percentage of people in the United States with at least a BA degree has gone up. Almost 38% of people in the United States uh, have a BA or better. Uh, I should have looked up Whatcom County before I came. I didn't, sorry. Uh, but I'm guessing uh, this county's probably, what, 55% with a BA or better, if not higher. You know, college towns tend to be uh, very high on, on that scale. What's interesting about that, though, uh, there's some recent research that we're trying to um, redo at the state level and the state legislative district level. But there's some interesting research that looked at Democratic versus Republican districts in the House of Representatives. It turns out that Democratic districts, 80% of them are above or at the 37.5 or 38% in college education or better. Uh, they're also, uh, they score high on the rate of people of color in a, in a district. So Democrats are overwhelmingly representing districts that are highly educated and have a high degree of diversity. Whereas Republicans overwhelmingly are represented, representing less than a BA and largely white. And I, as, as a way, I went back and looked at Jim Jordan and uh, these are some Republican con members of Congress. Jim Jordan's district in Ohio, 18% uh, of them have a college education and 94% white. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, similar sort of percentages. Look at Nancy Pelosi. Um, 78% uh, college education and 60% diverse. And so you know, just picking out these, these high profile members, you can see that it's, it's certainly going on. Um, a guy named Peter Turchin um, wrote a book uh, called Ages of Discord where he tries to track societies uh, that are in decline. And he's done this uh, over time with the Roman Empire and, and other civilizations. And he turned his attention to the United States. By the way, he has a new book out that I should, just came out a month ago called End of Times, uh, which is again about the United States and where he thinks we're headed. It's not a pretty picture, believe me. Anyway, he created a political stress index. And the stress index includes uh, all sorts of indicators of, of uh, both public and private debt levels and uh, other economic indicators. Um, political violence, and all, a lot of the things that I've talked about today. He put it into an index, and you can see uh, that he kind of charts it from about 1980. We're seeing this increase in political stress uh, levels uh, that have been going up. Uh, this slide only ends at 2010, but it's gone up continuously. In fact, he updated it, um, and he also matched it up to the buildup to the Civil War. And you can see that the, the uh, uh, the, the slopes of those lines are, uh, are quite similar. Um, in a radio interview I heard him do this last spring, uh, he thinks our problems are going to peak uh, maybe in the next five years. Um, so stay tuned. Um, what does the future hold? Well, my mentor in graduate school always said, I'd, I don't like to make predictions particularly about the future. Um, <laughs> and so I want to <laughs> say I'm not a soothsayer. Um, but there are some things that uh, you know, I've been thinking about. Uh, what are the prospects for institutional changes? Uh, you know, a lot of people think if we just got rid of the Electoral College and made presidents get elected on popular vote, uh, that would help you know, keep extremists out of, out of the White House. Not going to happen. Uh, to make that happen, you need a constitutional amendment. And only one state can block it. And I could name you 10 states right now that would block it. Uh, so that ain't going to happen. One thing that I think could work is you talked about ranked choice voting. That seemed to moderate things a little bit in Alaska. Uh, another thing I think that would help is if states went to more open primaries uh, where, you know, when you have Republicans running against Republicans and Democrats against them, Democrats, then to win the primary, you go for the extremists, right? The people who are very dedicated, who vote in primary elections. Uh, because primary electorates are not as big, nearly as big as general elections. And so you end up getting these extremist candidates that are uh, nominated and win the primary. And because of gerrymandering and other things, the way districts are drawn, uh, they end up winning the general. 
And so you don't, there's no incentive for in, in party primaries to move back towards the center. But open primaries mean everybody's on the ballot, top two vote, be, go, vote getters get in. Uh, ranked choice voting, of course, is a version of that because you rank your voters and they go through a complicated process of eliminating until they get a winner uh, by adding up the second and third choices. But again, you get more moderate uh, sorts of, of candidates. Um, but institutional changes are hard uh, because both parties you know, get something out of the current arrangements. And so um, it's hard to get them to move off of that. Um, I thought maybe a big focusing event like COVID might bring us together like World War II did. Uh, well, I was wrong. Um, see, don't listen to me. Um, COVID just amplified things, right? Uh, and made, it, uh, made things even in some ways worse. Um, there's some evidence that younger people are getting fed up. They're voting in larger percentages, which I think is a good thing. And this is why some politicians on the Republican side are trying to pass uh, new laws um, like absentee voting laws in Idaho. Um, they, the, the legislature just outlawed using student IDs as an acceptable form of identification for voting. Uh, so they're fighting a rear guard action though because you know, you figure out other, other ways to vote. Uh, but I think generation, a gener generational change might help. Some of the people who are the most angry are, are dying off. Um, I mentioned this before. <laughs> I mentioned this before, and, and that is, uh, I think if voters start punishing uh, politicians, they're smart people. If, you, if, if they see that uh, uh, the message they're sending out is, is not resonating with the voters, uh, then they're going to change their behavior. Because um, I really don't truly believe that some of them really believe some of the things they say. Uh, I think they're doing it because it's, they know it's what the, vo the base wants to hear. And again, I think on both the left and the right, uh, I think that's happening, maybe more on the right. Um, Will problems become so pressing? <clears throat> Climate change. <clears throat> uh, will things become so pressing that we're almost forced uh, back into some sense of agreement and normalcy? Again, noting that uh, those periods are very few and far between in, in, in our political history. And then finally, uh, we could just be changing what we've decided is quote unquote normal. Uh, and. Uh, I'll probably age out, as they like to say, before, uh, uh, before I find out the answer uh, to that question. But anyway, with that, uh, I want to thank you. And uh, I think Dan has some questions. And, um, and then I'll take questions from the audience if there are any. Thank you very much. And you want me to sit over there? And as you heard Stephen say, we leaked a lot of questions to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he answered a lot of questions, which is, which is good. So instead of having nine, um, ten, whatever, uh, I think I'm going to boil it down to just a couple before he turn questions over to you. And the, the first question is, your slide showed there were uh, roughly four ways to do, divide up the electorate. And my question is, how much more will the two, two groups in the middle take before they, they say enough, if ever, if ever? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, I think we're at that point, but I, I don't think they, there's any agreement on what they can do. Um, I mean, vote, turnout is extremely high. It's as high as it's been in 100 years, which of course was the Gilded Age. Um, and so I think they're trying. But um, there's really no path because they're, you know, you've got all these institutional features like gerrymandering and so forth that, you know, it's very hard to defeat uh, a Republican in a, in a district or a Democrat in a district that, you know, wins 60, 70 percent of the vote. And so I think they're struggling. I think a lot of, well, a lot of us are struggling with what to do. Um, and so um, I don't know. I really don't. Okay, well, the, uh, the final question, sort of, <laughs> is can, we, can democracy, as we 
want to know it, survive? I read a lot about this. And, you know, there's the optimist and there's the pessimist. Um, you know, I always thought that the quote unquote guardrails of democracy would work. I mean, that's what the constitutional designers were very straightforward about building in a lot of redundancy into our political system. One of the people I worked with actually wrote an article about how people who say government's supposed to be efficient, it's never supposed to be efficient, it's supposed to be uh, relatively fail safe. And so that's why you've got all the checks and balances, shared powers, et cetera. Uh, and it actually did work in 2020 because, you know, a lot of secretaries of state stepped up and certified the election, even when they had a lot of pressure not to. And, you know, I think it's going to boil down to uh, committed women and committed men in those positions. Um, you know, I'm not saying never because you know, I've seen more things that I'd never thought I'd saw already or thought I'd see already, but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. On good days, I'm hopeful. On bad days, I'm not so hopeful. And usually those are teaching days, so <laughs> go figure. Uh, th thank you again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm Jane Bright. I'm the program chair. I want to thank Dan for all the work he put into this. Hi, my name's... Um, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I'm curious about taking this down to a kind of a local level um, and what research has been done about that because I have the impression, it's just a personal impression, that a county like Whatcom is, is particularly tense because we have a, a, a blue city residing in a red county. And I think it's generally true of the Puget Sound area. And I'm wondering whether um, this is demonstrated by research and whether there is a local solution at all that's possible to this. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a great question because obviously working in state legislatures, uh, we're, we're kind of trickling down to that level. We're talking about applying our research now to school boards, um, to boards of overseers of community colleges, uh, which is a big deal over on the east side of the state. But um, there is some research. And again, it's a, it's a strategy among certain local uh, political activists to try and take over school boards and county commissions and to, you know, otherwise uh, infiltrate those, if I can use that word, infiltrate these, these local boards and commissions. And I think the, the answers are going to be the same. Is that you've got to get punished at the ballot box. Uh, but, you know, even though I teach at Washington State University, we also have a place in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is a beautiful place. But living in Pullman and living in, in Coeur d'Alene, it's like night and day. Because Kootenai County, where Coeur d'Alene is, uh, all these people from California, mostly Orange County, have retired there. And they've completely taken over the local politics. And, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, free America that I talked about, folks, have actually started a a different movement within the city to try and take back uh, the, 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 the school board. And, and so I think it's a, a struggle that's going to, it's, it's trickling down certainly in a lot of places. And what you said about Whatcom County is not unusual at all, no. I mean, even, even college towns, you know, the, the county has a larger footprint and a lot of it's rural, especially in the West. And so you've got the rural Contingent again. This is the divide between rural interests and their way of life, and the and the city people, I guess, city mice and country mice. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for that presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, my name is Darby Galligan, and I thought it was really interesting the role that um, education plays in this in this cleavage between um, the extreme parties, and it also to me seems kind of uh, hopeful. A hopeful um, indicator because that seems to be something that most people can agree on. Do you do you see do you see education being a pathway towards coming together? Well, I guess if enough people uh, get college degrees or better, uh, yes. Uh, but it's certainly the trend, and particularly in particular among women. Uh, women are getting college degrees at higher rates than men now. Uh, it's over forty percent for women. Um, but I think that there's got to be some uh, tipping point, uh, maybe 50%, I don't know. But it's really kind of encapsulated by that. That's the smart America folks, right, who aren't afraid of globalization. Uh, they're not afraid of change. 
What's that? Florida. Uh, Would you comment on Ron DeSantis and what he's doing in Florida in the context of this whole question about cleavage? Yes, is, is that accurate? Education. And education. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't looked and seen what the, uh, what the education levels are. And again, this has only been done at the, this research has been done at the congressional district level. Uh, it hasn't been applied statewide yet. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, Ron DeSantis' message has found uh, uh, an audience, um, and he's playing, you know, the culture war uh, cards, the identity politics cards, the woke card, and so forth. And it's resonating uh, with, um, you know, some of these people who are angry uh, about the changes that are going on um, in lots of different ways. Sir, that was one of the most depressing presentations I've seen in a long time. No, like seriously, <laughs> depressing, depressing because you didn't really offer any solutions. But before we get into that, since we were both of the same age or so, you mentioned Nixon and being pardoned. What would you have considered a proper punishment for Richard Nixon? I would suggest that he lost his job. That's a big punishment. Should he have been imprisoned? Comment. Um, you know, the, the point I was trying to make is that to a certain segment of population, the appearance, and I'm not, I'm not saying what should have happened to him, all I'm saying is that it gives the appearance that if you're powerful enough or have enough money, you can get away with it. And so, you know, there's a debate that among historians about whether or not, you know, Ford did the right thing. You can make the case that he did, uh, the ending the long national nightmare, as he called it. Uh, but I'm not prepared to weigh in on whether he should have gone to prison or not. I'm just saying that people looking at it, Americans, a common American looking at it goes, well, here's another you know, powerful person that just gets away with, with being in bad behavior. Can, I'm going to follow up on something about what gives you hope? Groups like this. Um, <laughs> frankly, it's true. Uh, is people who want to do something. Uh, to bridge the gaps between people. Uh, I don't know, um, you know necessarily what the political persuasions of all these folks are. Um, but, you know, the fact that, well, I have some idea, but <laughs> not everyone apparently. Uh, but. <laughs> A tool? Yeah, well, I think somebody has to say something hopeful here. Um, Please. So, uh, I uh, wanted to ask you what you know about media and the diversity of media and how that uh, affects all of the things that you're talking about. And I'd, I think I'm seeing, at least in our county, thanks to a few new media outlets that have opened up in the last year or two, there is, the temperature has come down a little bit and there, I think the diversity reduces the need for a particular voice to be dominant. I, I, I could be wrong about that, but at least what I'm going to present. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on in your question. And first of all, the answer, I don't study media and politics directly, and so I'm, I'm afraid I can't really address, address that part. And then, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about the United States is that we have such a decentralized, not just political system, but, you know, there's over 40,000 towns and municipalities in the United States. I mentioned over 3,000 counties. And the politics in every one of them, we're seeing this. You know, when we're studying these state level uh, civility issues, state legislative issues, you know, it's fascinating really to look at how unique every state is. And so in, in your community, it sounds like, you know, whatever it is that's going on, it seems to be, you know, turning the temperature down. And I think if you could bottle that, it would be a great thing and take it on the road. Um, as, as an example of what to do. Pardon me, it's a point of privilege. This is an unpaid non-political announcement. Uh, my name is Bruce Decent. I'm the founder of the City Club. And the City Club was founded as a result of the division among the community with the coming of Bellis Fair. At the time, I was Tim Douglas's city attorney, and I was given the responsibility of negotiating the deal that resulted in Bellis Fair. And I attended many, many public meetings in which Bellingham City Hall 
the largest city hall I've ever been inside, I've been in a lot of city halls, was packed with standing room only people, divided between those who wanted to retain the community that we knew and grew up in, which had department stores downtown and a, a vital center of the community, versus those folks who wanted to create what in those days was viewed as something very positive, a big mall with great shopping opportunities and parking lots where you didn't have to pay anything. Well, Bruce, sure. You had a question for our speaker. Yeah. <laughs> well, you took the question from me. I, I, will, I will wind up. I, I want to thank all of you for being here because the purpose of the City Club is to educate and promote civil discourse exactly what we're doing. My closing comment is, would you please invite three friends, four neighbors, to join the City Club and participate in this democratic process? Thank you. And thank you for starting City Club. Um, we have a question over here. Hi, I'm hopeful to hear maybe some more practical steps that people can take as individuals. Uh, some things I've thought of is paying for investigative journalism and also supporting media outlets that speak across the spectrum of, uh, you know, the political spectrum. Uh, and there are, you know, several of those that I'm aware of, but that's just what I came here with. But I'm hoping to hear if, if there's anything else that you have uh, thought of or come up with with like practical steps that we can take and tell others who when these issues come up in conversation tell them that they can take you know yeah join the city club is one thank you for that <laughs> yeah I you know I understand everyone's frustration and me not coming with the silver bullet and uh, but you know this is something that that uh, even some uh, uh, of, the, of the people that know what I do, but, but really don't know what I do, uh, is they think I'm a, a technology transfer person, where I take ideas and turn them into ideas. I, I turn ideas into something practical. I'm trying to understand, so smart people like you and the others in this room can you know, develop solutions that fit their own you know, community's needs. Um, I wish I had you know, the sort, of, I'd make a million dollars. Um, you know, if I became a consultant, but that's not what I was trained to do. Um, and so I'm sorry, I can't, I, that I can't come up with any better ideas. Uh, you, you haven't mentioned the role of capitalism, which I'm wondering isn't an underpinning that created the economic disparity that might be the underpinnings of a lot of this. Yeah, that, that's a very deep question. <laughs> It's sort of a meta question. Um, you know, it goes back to um, to what extent should you know what we call free enterprise, you know, individuals out for themselves. Uh, how should that work when we're also supposed to be looking out for each other and so forth? That's a real tension, um, you know, between you know, freedom to do what you want and um, you know what do you owe. Uh, others. I mean, there's lots of different ideas, but yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's 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 kind of woven into the fabric of of uh, you know everything that 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 we talked about. Um, so yeah. Hello, my name is Floyd Smith. I'm a City Club member. Uh, I was a City Club member for years in Portland, and I'm a left of center, non-aligned cynic. And, and I was a reporter for many years. So uh, my question relates uh, to that to a degree because I, I don't see an early end to the divisiveness. I'm more inclined to think that country could divide into city-states, um, given the trajectory we're on. Would you speak to that possibility, please? Uh yeah, there's a lot of reasons I think that would be difficult to do, um, unless you had a mass, you know, exodus of, 
of people who disagree with you know, what city state they, they live in currently? And are they just gonna you know, be dominated by the other side then? Uh, or are they gonna matriculate to a city state that they agree with? I mean, there's all sorts of, of legal issues that I can't uh, really address uh, in terms of you know, who's gonna decide what the boundaries of, of a city state are gonna be. Uh, what are the, how are you gonna determine the rules for those city states? You know, we've got a very fragile, obviously fragile sort of setup right now with people pushing the boundaries of, of different rules that exist. Um, you know, democratic governments are, are, are complicated and um, you know, I, I, I really don't see that uh, a fracturing, a splitting of the country, um, you know, is gonna, is gonna work. And again, I don't know what the conception of a city-state would be. It'd be a county level or a regional level. Um, I, 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 I just don't, I haven't read anything about uh, what that would look like. I think it'd be pretty unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> would everybody have their own money? Uh, <laughs> It's almost sounds, it almost sounds like, you know, before we had the Constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and the reason they stopped that with the Constitution is because all 13 states were, that were in the Union then were starting to raise their own armies. Uh, they were beginning to print their own money. And so that's why the Constitution was, uh, the Constitutional Convention was held. Years ago, I read a book, sort of a sociological study called Bowling Alone. Yes. Robert You're Putnam. You're familiar, yes. Robert Putnam. Yeah, and, and of all the many post-World War II social, ev not events, but social circumstances that changed, created divisiveness, uh, included um, change in gender roles. That seemed to be a sort of a major shift. Women went to work, women started going to college, destabilized things a little bit. Have you done any study along that line? I have not. But I'm glad you brought up Bowling Alone because I think that's an important part of the, he was very prescient. That book came out in 1980. Uh, what Bowling Alone means is he used that as sort of a metaphor for the decline of interconnectedness in communities. The decline of league bowling uh, is, is what he kind of you know, pegged his argument on. But his general argument was about how we're becoming more and more isolated socially uh, from others. Uh, and that feeds in, of course, if you don't know the other person. This happens in, this happening in Congress, actually. Um, when Congress stopped going on junkets together, that goes hand in hand with you know, the rise of incivility. If you know somebody and know their family, it's a lot harder to call them names. Uh, and now, very few representatives and senators live in D.C. anymore or the surrounding area. They go home. You know, Congress is only in session Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and they're on a plane Thursday night to go back home uh, so they can, you know, raise money and otherwise look like they're connected to their district. And so I think this isolation in Congress is, is part of the problem, certainly. I didn't talk about it, but... And, and I think the, you know, there's all sorts of reasons, and again, a good sociologist could tell you why we're more isolated now than we were. Um, but Bowling Alone is a, is a great book. We have a question in the back. Hi, from the back end here. Uh, recently, my husband and I met a bicyclist from the Netherlands, and he and I and my husband were sitting around over dinner and talking, and he said, oh, we have the same divisiveness in our own country. Can you cast any perspectives about what we may see as a purely American problem and whether this is also echoing throughout the world. Great point. Uh, I should add that to the, to the slides, but I already think it's too long. <coughs> but you know, it's, hap it's happening all over Western Europe. Uh, what you're seeing in France, uh, Marie Le Pen and the rise of the, the, of the front, right, right front movement. It's happening in Turkey. Uh, it's happened in Hungary with Viktor Orban. Um, it's happening a little bit in Great Britain. The um, Brexit movement was an anti-immigrant, anti-globalization movement. Um, so it's happening all over the world, and for a lot of the same reasons. Um, it's the same sort of fears. We're a global economy now, and so some of the, the same things that are happening here 
uh, are happening all over Western Europe. Italy is another example. There's a gentleman here. It seems that we're moving into an age of art artificial intelligence now, and we're rapidly going in that way. Is this just going to exacerbate the problem, do you think, or is, this, is there any hope in using it to bring us together? Boy, talk about going out of my ballpark. Uh, I know as much as anybody who reads the New York Times uh, and Washington Post, uh, which, you know, I'm, as, I'm guessing like you are. Who knows how it's going to change things? I mean, my closest brush with it now is, you know, some students are using Ch chat GPT to turn in their papers. Um, and my view on that, and I joke with my colleagues about it, is if it makes their papers better, I'm all for it. Uh, I think some of them could use some artificial or some kind of intelligence uh, in their papers. Uh, so, yeah, I, what it's going to do to the political system, I don't think anybody has any idea about that. You had mentioned that the electoral college is not going to be done away with, of course. But there was a plan in place and an effort throughout the different states it's called the National Popular Vote Compact. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a few states that have passed it so far. Do you see this as a possibility of ever occurring where, you know, if you have enough states in agreement that all of their popular vote will go towards the candidate that won in that state, so that way, there's enough electoral college votes to overturn the election, or I mean to win the election. The real problem with that, of course, is the candidate that loses uh, the electoral college um, and, and, and didn't win the popular vote, they're going to sue. Uh, and I, I can't see the Supreme Court ignoring the Constitution, um, even if the states agree uh, that they're going to just go by the popular votes. But then all of their electoral votes would go towards, so they would win the electoral. Well, that's what happens now, right? Yeah. Yes. So. Not all of those states determine how they divide up their electoral votes. Some of these, some states do. They don't, you know, all go towards. So, so are you talking about what goes on in, in Nebraska and Maine, where they do the electoral college by uh, individual congressional districts. Um, again, that would be up to the other 40, you know, 49 states uh, to adopt that. Uh, and so. I, well, from what I understand, it's only, it's only enough states to win the electoral vote, I mean, to win the electoral college. So if you get enough states that have enough electoral votes, Combined together to get over, what is it, 192 electoral votes? Uh, no, it's 237. Okay, sorry, I'm behind. Uh, just as uh, Dan just reminded me that in October, we will be doing a program on the Supreme Court, uh, which is kind of relevant to, to a lot of this conversation as well. So, so put that on, on your uh, agenda as well. In November, we're also doing something on mental health with uh, with kids. So uh, we have a lot of interesting things coming up. Um, this gentleman's had his hand up for a while. Yes. Yeah, so quickly, hello. Quickly, um, if I remember the charts right, the anger America was mostly rural. Now, am I at all reasonable in assuming that some of that anger is due to? problem with the farm bill with much of the rural occupation is farming here. Yeah, the, the farm bill is, uh, it's, there's a, every five years Congress passes an omnibus farm bill. And uh, I don't think it's really anger over that. Okay. That's an issue. That, yeah, that, that's an issue. I mean, there's usually bipartisan support uh, for uh, a lot of big subsidy programs for the, the farmers. I mean, they, they did, they did quite well uh, during the Trump presidency and after COVID and so forth. Uh, the government pumped a lot of money into the farm community. But it's more cultural. I think their way of life is what they see threatened. Um, it's the, you know, the, the old you know, sort of traditional idea that farmers are the salt of the earth and, and therefore you know, family farming is you know, 
is this inherently good thing. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying they're seeing a way of life that is, they think is being stopped out. Hi, Kim Lund, I'm a City Club member. And I just wanted to um, give, while we're looking for notes of um, positivity here in this conversation, the question about AI and just share that I think that while technology has absolutely played a role in bringing us to where we are, um, my daughter just interviewed uh, with the MIT Research Lab to do a project to help politicians make better informed choices using machine learning language models that will be scraping all kinds of platforms and really focusing on underrepresented communities and the spaces of which they're online. No, I was just going to say that I think that technology can play a role in helping us get out of this and that uh, there is a future in optimism for technology. We have something that's happening all over the rest of the country, but not here. And I'm wondering whether that's something, it's the rest of the world too, is going to be something that can cause cohesion. And that's climate change, which is really affecting my friends and uh, relatives in the South. And it's a big problem. I'm a scientist, I know. Yeah, well, I, I, I said uh, at the end of my talk, I, I mentioned, is there going to be a big, <coughs> a big focusing event? Uh, the problem with climate change, of course, is it's slow moving. Although this summer, um, this summer we're seeing, but again, it's hard, it's hard for, you know, for the earth scientists to draw direct lines between a coal plant in China and what's going on in Oklahoma. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm obviously, uh, know that there's connections, but it's hard to make it. You know, one of the things that always surprises uh, the students I talk to about this is one of the institutions that's most worried about climate change in the, in the United States is the Defense Department because it's going to have all sorts of impacts on, you know, mass migrations from the tropics, for example. There's going to be wars over water. Um, a lot of their bases are in, in, in Virginia, for example, are sinking. Uh, and because of sea level rise, are not gonna be inhabitable anymore. And so the Defense Department is really on board with that. And I think as big businesses also see, and they already are, seeing their interests get impacted, I think they're gonna get on board uh, as well. And so, um, you know, I think climate change is obviously a huge issue going forward. Um, and it's, I'm just hoping that enough people see it as the issue that it needs to be seen as, is awaken in time. It's also a very difficult global problem to address because you have a global commons, right? You know, why should the United States do anything if India won't? Um, and so there's gotta be international agreements uh, about this. Any other last thoughts? You know, I did have one other optimistic <laughs> movement <clears throat> in Utah, um, there's a nonprofit organization that started what they call the Dignity Index. And what they're doing right now, uh, and this actually ties into the AI question too, is right now they're having armies of graduate students go through and code uh, Utah congressional districts uh, and their gubernatorial races. They're coding their speeches into um, civil and civil on a scale, the Dignity Index. And so what they plan to do is, you know, after speeches and debates and what have you, they release this information to the public. So you can get an idea from their scale, who's dignified, who's acting, speaking in a dignified way and who's not. The idea being, of course, is it makes it easier, you have more information about who to punish. Another interesting thing that happened in Utah, believe it or not, and this happened in the 2020 gubernatorial race, uh, the Republican and the Democrat did a, a series of joint television ads where they said, we disagree with each other on issues, but we're not gonna call each other names. And we want you to be civil as well. That's the kind of modeling behavior that I think could really help things. But you've got to induce candidates to do that somehow. Uh, that kind of bubbled up, partly probably because of the church, 
but um, you know, being able to publicize the Dignity Index. And they're, they're trying to, I had a conference call with the person who's leading that cause, and I said, instead of having graduate students do it, can't you do that through AI? And they're working on that with some people from Berkeley, believe it or not, uh, to try and create software to code these speeches. So. This, this has been Thank a you. fascinating program uh, and uh, an interesting walk through history <laughs> <laughs> as well as what's happening today. So let's give Stephen a big round of applause. Thank you. And a big thank you to Dan Ross uh, with the Program Committee for the City Club. <laughs> and uh, remind you to fill out some evaluations, please. We need some to feedback to Humanities Washington. Uh, the Program Committee, frankly, we have a good time, but that's a whole other conversation. You know, trying to find topics and speakers and being able to work with Humanities Washington uh, is, is a great resource for us. And a uh, couple things, uh, if anyone's interested in getting more involved with City Club at any level, uh, doing some volunteer work, uh, let us know. And uh, keep us posted on topics of interest to you and let us know uh, what you want to hear yeah. about, and we look Jane, forward to Jane, seeing can I everybody. Just that yes, there are 30 people in the speakers bureau. If you go on the Humanities Washington website, you can go through and see all the topics and all the people that are yeah. doing this. And I, and I think the uh, the speaker who did the uh, mystery books was through Humanities Washington too. So we had an interesting spread. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Keep us posted on what you'd like to hear, and uh, we'll see you in August. <laughs> <laughs>